This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles. Unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month and 30 days for free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the code brainfood. Now, if you're looking for a specific recommendation from me on that platform, well, I would absolutely check out 101 events that made the 20th century. If you enjoy the sort of content we make here at Today I Found Out, well, I think you'll really enjoy it. You know, whilst Serious is also a fairly relaxed view. There's this Australian guy narrating it. It's pretty chilled out. Uh, it's super engaging, also very enjoyable. Curiosity Stream is available on many platforms where that broke you Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, a lot, a lot of different places, and worldwide. Like I said, you can get unlimited access, just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, first 30 days are completely free. Just sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code brainfood, or one word, lowercase no quotes during the sign-up process. In the 19th century, among other times throughout history, it was very difficult for universities to get human bodies for students to dissect so that they could train in surgical techniques and, in general, just learn about the human body. The only ones that could legally be acquired by universities at this point were those from executed convicts. This had once been an adequate supply, but thanks to certain legal changes that resulted in a drastic reduction of executions, and thanks to the fact that the study of anatomy had become more popular as medical science progressed, there began to exist a huge shortage of human bodies. In order to get around this problem, college professors and private tutors would sometimes pay under the table for bodies no questions asked. From this, it was not uncommon for people known as resurrectionists or body snatchers to watch cemeteries and when a body was buried, they would dig it up. They'd then take any valuables that may have been left with the person. Finally, if the person was fresh enough, they'd take it to sell. This practice became bad enough that it wasn't unheard of for relatives of a deceased loved one to stand in shifts over the grave for several days to keep the body safe from being stolen while it was still fresh. This practice is actually thought to be where all the bodies found in the basement of Ben Franklin's home at 36 Craven Street in London came from. The remains appear to have been from when Franklin allowed anatomist William Hewson to set up an anatomy school there. Given the range of skeletons found from children to adults, Hewson also appears to have purchased bodies illegally rather than getting them from executed criminals. Making good use of them, though, among other discoveries, he became the first person to clearly describe the three components of blood – red blood cells, white blood cells, and plasma. In any event, the practice of illegally selling bodies to medical professionals all brings us to William Burke and William Hare, who decided to skip the whole waiting stage. Originally from Ireland, Burke and Hare both seemed to have led more or less crime-free lives up until the point when they decided to go on a killing spree. Burke had previously been a servant to an officer in the military and had a wife and two kids, though when he eventually decided to move to Scotland, his wife refused to go, so he left her and the kids behind. Once in Scotland, he worked various jobs, including baker, cobbler, weaver, and a general labourer. As for Hare, he worked as a union canal labourer in Scotland. The two met when Burke moved to the Westport region of Edinburgh into Tanner's Close, where Hare owned a lodging house that Burke lived in for a time. They began their crime at this lodging house, though it all started innocently enough with an elderly gentleman named Donald who owed Hare four pounds in rent, up and dying while at the lodging house. Knowing that one could sell a body to universities, they decided to fill the coffin with bark and steal the body to sell and make up the loss of rent that the dead man owed. They originally intended to sell the body to a Professor Alexander Monroe of Edinburgh Medical College, but after making inquiries, they were redirected to private lecturer Dr. Robert Knox, who taught anatomy classes to university students. Once contacted, Dr. Knox's assistants instructed Burke and Hare to bring the body after nightfall. When they arrived that night, the body was inspected and the industrious duo were awarded £10 and 7 shillings, which would be about £730 today, or $950. And this sale seems to have got the wheels turning in their heads. Not long after, Hare had another sick tenant on his hands, Joseph the Miller. While Joseph wasn't necessarily sick enough to die, they reportedly rationalized that he might, and as he was in great pain, they ought to just put him out of his misery sooner rather than later and sell his body after the deed was done. 
They did so first by getting him really drunk to the point that he passed out. Next, one of them pinched his nose and held his mouth shut, while the other laid on his body and held Joseph's arms and legs down in case he should struggle. By doing this, they left no mark of violence on the body which might arouse suspicion. It also made it appear that Joseph had died either of illness or over-intoxication. The pair then decided to repeat this process whenever sick tenants popped up. The problem was that Hare's tenants remained annoyingly healthy. It was then that they decided to take this money-making scheme to the next level, simply luring people in from the streets, initially people who wouldn't be terribly missed or would be thought to have died from natural causes. While the exact details of their murders are hard to discern due to differing accounts of events by the two and Hare's wife and Burke's mistress, as well as the scant amount of direct evidence, from here it is generally thought their murders went as follows. Next up was Abigail Simpson in February. The two invited this elderly woman to spend the night at Hare's lodging house rather than return home directly. She was in Edinburgh temporarily to collect her pension money. They subsequently got her drunk, but made the mistake of getting too drunk themselves, at which point they passed out and slept through the night. The next morning, Simpson awoke and was preparing to leave, but was first offered some whiskey to cure her hangover. They soon got her very drunk again, and she passed out and was subsequently smothered in the same fashion as Joseph the Miller was. Dr. Knox inspected the body personally and was pleased to find it extremely fresh, paying £10 for it. Next was an unnamed Englishman. This man was a match salesman who became ill while lodging at Hare's. Burke and Hare subsequently, to quote Burke, put him out of his misery and sold his body. Then there was an unnamed woman who was lured in by Hare's wife Margaret, who later claimed to be ignorant of her husband's deeds, though probably wasn't. For example, on this occasion, she lured the woman in, got her very drunk, and then sent for Burke and her husband, leaving them alone with the passed out woman. Next, on April the 9th, 1828, an 18-year-old Mary Patterson and her friend Janet Brown, who were prostitutes and fairly well known around town, were invited to breakfast at Burke's brother's house. Patterson became extremely drunk and passed out, but Brown held her liquor better. Burke then invited Brown to a tavern to get her further drunk. She still didn't get drunk enough to pass out, so he once again invited her back to his brother's house for more drinks. However, Helen McDougall, Burke's mistress, showed up and was upset at Burke having prostitutes in the house, and an argument ensued. He eventually got rid of Helen, but she remained outside, screaming at the house, so Brown decided to leave, despite Burke trying to get her to stay. This argument ultimately saved her life. Patterson was not so lucky and was murdered and sold to Dr. Knox. Brown decided to return after becoming concerned for Patterson and asked after her. She was told that she had left with Burke and would be returning soon, so Brown decided to wait, which nearly cost her her own life. However, her landlady became concerned about her after learning of the missing Patterson and that Brown was alone waiting with the people who had been with Patterson last, and so she sent her servant to fetch Brown from the house. Despite the fact that many of the students recognized Patterson, having previously hired her services, her body being sold and dissected was kept quiet, and Brown was not told by anyone what had happened to Patterson, despite her frequently inquiring around town. Then there was a woman named Effie who was an acquaintance of Burke's and a beggar who he occasionally bought leather from when he worked as a cobbler. When she offered to sell some leather scraps to Burke, he invited her to drink at the lodging house's stable. She was murdered after their standard modus operandi and sold for £10. Next, a drunk woman was in the process of being arrested and taken to jail until she sobered up when Burke claimed to police that he knew her and would take her home. Apparently the worst police officers of all time, they went ahead and handed the woman over to Burke. The two subsequently murdered her in their normal fashion and sold her body for £10. An old woman and her deaf grandson came next in June of 1828. Burke had been attempting to lure an old man home at the time, promising him free whiskey, but while walking home with the man, an old woman with her deaf grandson asked Burke for directions. Burke then told them he'd take them where they needed to go and left the old man, who was none too pleased at the loss of the promised free whiskey. Rather than taking her directly where she wanted to go, Burke offered to let her have a rest at his home. The grandmother was made drunk after their normal fashion and smothered while the boy was entertained in another room by Helen and Margaret. Once she was dead, they argued on whether they should simply let the boy go as they didn't think he'd drink whiskey and they didn't want to make it obvious that the boy had been murdered. In the end, though, because they were afraid he might return with the authorities looking for his grandmother, they decided to kill him. Rather than get him drunk and smother him, they instead broke his back. The two bodies were sold together for £16. Next, we have one Mrs. Ostler, who came to the lodging house and stayed briefly before being murdered and sold. Anne McDougall was a relative of Helen McDougall's, Burke's mistress. 
While in Edinburgh, she decided to stay at the lodging house to her doom. Burke supposedly didn't take part in this murder, asking her to do the smothering as Anne was a friend. Next, we have Mary Haldane, who, like Mary Patterson, was a prostitute. Her invited her back to his lodging house and got her drunk, and he and Burke smothered her in the stable. Peggy Haldane was Mary's daughter, and unfortunately, she learned that her mother had gone to Hare's lodging house, so she went looking for her. Initially, the two denied that Mary had been there, saying they didn't take in prostitutes. Eventually, they admitted she stopped by and invited Peggy in for a drink, and subsequently got her drunk and murdered her, as they had done to her mother. James Wilson was an 18-year-old mentally disabled person who was somewhat crippled with a bad foot. He was fairly well known around town due to the fact that he often lodged with various people, whoever would take him in. He was also known for his kind-hearted disposition and for entertaining children on the streets. In October of 1828, Hare approached Wilson, who asked him if Hare had seen his mother. Hare replied that he knew where she was and Wilson should follow him. Soon, Burke joined them, but they couldn't manage to get James to drink much. Despite this, they attempted to kill him anyways, but he almost proved a match for the two. In the struggle, he managed to throw them off him and pin Burke down, but the pair prevailed and he was eventually smothered. After he was murdered, his mother began inquiring after him. When Jamie's body was recognized by students of Dr. Knox, Knox quickly began dissecting the cadaver's face as well as cut off the head and feet in order that if authorities came knocking, no one could later positively identify the body. So this all brings us to how they were caught. Burke and his mistress, Helen McDougall, no longer lived with Hare when they killed their last person. As to the reason why, it appears that Hare suggested they kill Helen, with Burke refusing to let that happen. Thus, it's thought that the bear might have moved out for Helen's safety after this, as the move appears to have happened almost immediately after the subject was broached. However, Burke and Hare continued their scheme, despite no longer living together. Whatever the case, Mary Doherty, or sometimes referred to as Mary Campbell, was lured into Burke's new lodging house thanks to both having thick Irish accents, and when Burke learned her name, he told her his mother was at Doherty, and they were probably relatives. She was not murdered directly due to the fact that there were other lodgers present at his home, James and Anne Gray. To get around the problem, they convinced the Grays to leave and stay at Hare's lodging house. However, Anne Gray returned the next day to retrieve her stockings that she had left near a bed. Initially, she was not allowed to retrieve them, but later managed to get into the room and found Doherty's body under the bed. She subsequently alerted the police, though not before being offered £10 a week by Helen to keep quiet. Birkenshaw did manage to remove the body before the police arrived, but not without witnesses observing them carrying a large tea chest from the house. The porter of Dr. Knox also later confirmed that the body in question was brought in in a tea chest. However, initially, this was not known, and the police had little direct evidence. But when interrogated, Burke and Helen's stories as to when Doherty left didn't match. One said 7 a.m., one said 7 p.m., so they were arrested. The police then discovered Doherty's body in Dr. Knox's classroom. When the story of this last murder became well known publicly, others came forward and began to connect disappearances with people coming in contact with Burke and Hare shortly before they vanished. However, because there was very little direct evidence that the two had actually murdered anyone, no actual witnesses and the bodies having been disposed of, the case against them, surprisingly, wasn't a good one. It was also unclear at the time whether Helen and Margaret had actually been involved directly or even knew of what was going on. With the lack of direct evidence, the Lord Advocate decided that Burke had been the leader, presumably as the last murder took place in his lodging, and so offered Hare full immunity if he would just confess and give evidence against Burke. Hare accepted the deal and also implicated Helen, who, as noted, Hare had previously suggested the pair murder. As for Burke, he soon cleared her, claiming his lady love knew nothing of the murders, though this is very likely false from the evidence at hand. On that note, while authorities still thought that Helen had been involved because it could not be directly proven, the jury was forced to let her off, but convicted Burke. When the verdict was read, Burke was reportedly overjoyed that Helen was free, but was himself subsequently executed via hanging just over a month later, on January 28, 1829. Seats with a view of the gallows apparently went for an extremely high price over normal executions, and it was a bit of a jam-packed occasion. In fact, when he witnessed the angry crowd screaming at him, Burke reportedly rushed to the noose in an attempt to speed up the process, possibly afraid they might turn into a mob and make his death a lot worse than a short drop and a sudden stop. He did not die immediately upon being dropped, however, but kicked about for about one to two minutes before finally going still. He was then let to hang for about half an hour.
As for the aftermath of everyone else, Hare was released from prison in February of 1829 after being cleared thanks to his aid in convicting Burke. He was initially to be set free immediately as per the deal he had struck. However, it was discovered that an old law allowed that a person might be detained until they could pay off the cost of their prosecution, so he was kept for two months until he could do so. Little is known of what happened to him after that. He disappeared shortly after being trapped in the King's Arms Inn, with a mob having chased him into the building, attempting to stone him. He was allowed to stay at the inn until well into the night, when the crowd dispersed. Once they were gone, he fled and was never heard from again. Helen McDougall was likewise attacked by a mob and was only saved from being killed by the police. She then fled to England, but was again attacked by a mob and saved by the police. What happened to her next isn't known, but it is thought that she moved to Australia. Margaret Hare was also met with a mob upon her release, encountering a mob both in Glasgow and Greenock before fleeing to Ireland. It is also not known what happened to her next. As for Dr. Knox, Burke swore that Knox had known nothing about where the bodies were coming from, so he wasn't convicted of any crime. However, while Dr. Knox continued to teach for a time, he had the problem of frequently having his lectures interrupted by crowds yelling that he should have been strung up with Burke. Dr. Knox's home was also frequently vandalized. Eventually, students stopped wanting to take his classes, and he lost his primary source of income. He did, at least for a little while, continue to buy bodies, making his classes one of the few that a student could attend and actually get to work on a real body, so some still attended. But this advantage ended with the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which greatly expanded the supply of cadavers through legal means, which subsequently mostly killed the black market for cadavers. He then tried to get an official position at the university, but failed. He was also forced to resign his position as curator at a museum he himself had founded. He eventually moved to London, working at a cancer hospital and publishing various works. As for Burke's body, after being hung, it was sent to be dissected at Edinburgh Medical College. This dissection was done publicly, led by Professor Alexander Monroe. Burke's skeleton and tanned skin are currently on display at Edinburgh Medical College in their museum. The Police Information Centre in Edinburgh also has a card case made out of Burke's skin. Also, when Professor Monroe led the dissection of Burke, he took some of the blood to use as ink and wrote this with it. This is written with the blood of W.M. Burke, who was hanged at Edinburgh. This blood was taken from his head. Also in the aftermath of all this, a new word was coined, and that was burking, which was just a word to describe the general smothering method that Burke and Hare had used to kill their victims. Finally, if you're wondering, all total, it's estimated that Burke and Hare took in approximately £160, close to £17,000 today, or around $22,000, for all of the bodies they sold over the course of the year. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos every day of the week. Also, please do check out CuriosityStream. There is a link to them below. And as always, thank you for watching.